This morning, you'll know our guest editor is the former Conservative Minister, Sir Sajid Javid. During his programme, he's been looking at the potential of artificial intelligence to transform society and the way we live our lives, exploring what he terms the good, the bad and the ugly of AI. He wanted to speak to one of the early pioneers of this technology, Geoffrey Hinton, known as one of the so-called godfathers of AI. Hinton worked at Google for over a decade in deep learning technology and earlier this year won the Nobel Prize for Physics. Sir Sajid began the interview by asking him how it felt to win that historic prize it felt very strange to begin with i thought it was a prank um, because i'm not a physicist do you, think, whole, did you people, think it was some that ai dreamt up no i didn't no. think it was ai i thought it was someone playing a prank but they had a strong swedish accent so i fairly yeah. soon came to realize that <laughs> um this was real i wonder if you thought when you started this work this is where we would be now i didn't think it would be where we would be now i thought at some point in the future we would get here because the situation we're in now is that most of the experts in the field think that sometime within probably the next 20 years, we're going to develop AIs that are smarter than people. And that's a very scary thought. Well, I'd, I'd read somewhere, I know this is a really simple way to put it, that you know, humans are something like, I don't know, 10,000 times plus smarter than the goldfish. And ASI, artificial super intelligence, could be 10,000 times more intelligent than a human. Is, is that the kind of thing we're talking about? It's not clear what times means in that context. Mm. I like to think of it as imagine yourself and a three-year-old. We'll be the three-year-olds and they'll be the grown-ups. Do you think people, sort of society, generally realise you know, the profound change that's coming? You know, I've, I've referred to the change AI will bring on par with the sort of creation of the wheel or the discovery of the fire. Do you think it could go that far? Oh, oh yes. I, th I think it's like the Industrial Revolution. In the Industrial Revolution, human strength ceased to be that relevant because machines were mm. just stronger. And if you wanted to dig a ditch, you dug it with the machine. What we've got now is something that's replacing human intelligence. And just ordinary human intelligence will not be at the cutting edge anymore. It'll be machines. What do you think life might be like then in, in say, 10 to 20 years from now? It'll depend very much on what our political systems do with this mm. technology. So my big worry at present is that we're in a situation now where we need to be very careful and very thoughtful about developing a potentially very dangerous technology. It's going to have lots of wonderful effects in healthcare and in almost every industry, it's going to make things more efficient. But we need to be very careful about the development of it. We need regulations to stop people using it for bad things. And we don't appear to have those kinds of political systems in place at present. Yeah. You know, speaking of myself also as a former government minister, and as, especially as a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, I'm interested also to know about how you think this might change existing structures. You know, so, for example, you, know, you have talked about many people you know, losing their jobs, you know, as, as, as that obviously happened with the Industrial Revolution and what that means for society and the types of jobs that might be lost. And and that's what I might call, when I talk about the bad, I mean, that's the kind of thing, it's a, it's a sort of a necessary outcome of technological change. But how profound do you think that will be? Well, if you want to know what happened in the Industrial Revolution to ordinary people, I think reading Dickens is good. I think Dickens mm. characterised quite a lot of what happened to ordinary people there. There'll be similar amounts of change caused by AI. And my worry is that even though it'll cause huge increases in productivity, which should be good for society, it may end up being very bad for society if all the benefit goes to the rich and a lot of people lose their jobs and become poorer. If you have a big gap between rich and poor, it's very bad for society. Yeah. What's different this time? So these things are more intelligent than us. So there was never any chance in the Industrial Revolution that machines would take over from people just because they were stronger. We were still in control because we had the intelligence. Now there's the threat that these things can take control. So that's one big difference. And I think perhaps also it's the pace of change now as well. It's, it's very profound as well. The, the actual pace we're seeing, how quickly this is all happening. Yes, it's very, very fast. Much faster than I expected. Because it's so fast, we haven't had time to do the research needed on how to keep it under control. OK, and let's just talk, uh, because I'd be interested in your views on this and some of the good things that are already emerging from AI. For example, as a former health secretary, I think a lot about the advances that, that can be made in medical research and life sciences. Is that a sector you'd sort of pick and say that that actually is something where, you know, we can really extend healthy life years for people. We can all live longer and have happier and healthy lives. Yes. So I think it's going to do tremendous mm. good in areas like medicine. And that's why 
it's unrealistic to talk about stopping the progress. It's unrealistic to say, this stuff could be very dangerous, let's stop developing it. I didn't sign a partition that asked for that a few mm. years ago because it just seemed com completely unrealistic to me. In healthcare, for example, in a few years' time, we'll be able to have family doctors who, in effect, have seen 100 million patients mm. and know all the tests ever done on you and on your relatives. 200,000 people about die every year from bad diagnoses. Most of that's going to go away. Already, an AI system is better than a doctor at doing diagnoses. And the combination of the AI system and the doctor is much better than the doctor at dealing with difficult cases. And the AI system is only going to get better. In the past, you previously predicted, I think you said there's a 10% chance that AI will lead to human extinction within the next three decades. Has anything changed your analysis of that? Um, not really. I think 10 to 20. Oh, um, you're going up. <laughs> if anything... You see, we've never had to deal with things more intelligent than ourselves before. And how many examples do you know of a more intelligent thing being controlled by a less intelligent thing? There are very few examples. Yeah, very few. There's a mother and baby. Evolution put a lot of work into allowing the baby to control the mother. Mm. But that's about the only example I know of. Perhaps then just to end on that, despite what you just said, I remain an optimist about AI and what it means. Am I right to feel that way? I hope you're right to feel that way. My worry is that the invisible hand is not going to keep us safe. So just leaving it to the profit motive of large companies is not going to be sufficient to make sure they develop it safely. And you can see that if you look at the history of open AI. Initially, they were very concerned with safety. And as time went by and the potential profits got bigger, they got less and less concerned with safety. The only thing that can force those big companies to do more research on safety is government regulation. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion, uh, Jeffrey, and uh, there's, there's a lot of food for thought there. Thank you very much indeed for, for joining us today on this programme. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.